Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run through some slides and talk about um, a project which has become, um, has taken over my life um, called the Hip Hop Word Count. And it's, a, um, it's an online searchable database built from the lyrics of over 50,000 songs um, from 1979 with the beginning of recorded hip hop um, to present day. And I spent a few years building the database. Um, it wasn't my intention to build a database. My intention was to make art from it and to do research from it and have understanding um, of, of hip hop in, in, on a broad scale. But I quickly realized that nothing like this was out there, so then I had to build the tool. So the tool building is done, and now the next phase of what, you, what, what you're going to see um, slides from are um, um, art making from, from the database, which was the original idea. So just a little bit of background. Um, I was, I was, I was um, groomed by my um, family to be an engineer um, from elementary school um, to high school. I went to Brooklyn Tech High School. And we had majors there. My major was electrical engineering. And then undergrad, I entered Morehouse um, in the dual degree program with, um, with Georgia Tech. So I was totally going to be an engineer. But somewhere, um, I think junior year, sophomore year, I decided um, through a, an interesting um, see, um, a chain of events to be an artist and to design. Um, so, so as a result, all of the art that I've, that I've made is informed by my um, scientific training, my scientific background. So you'll probably never see me put um, paint on a brush on the canvas. There'll, there'll be either a, um, a silk screen or a, a camera, or in this case, a database in between me and, and the object. And also, I love hip hop. Um, um, I was born a year before hip hop, and um, and and um, and it has informed my life. I've I've had a lot of life lessons from it, from the lyrics, um, and me and my friends um, talk about it in in an in depth way. I remember um, recording recording songs from the radio, transcribing lyrics and coming to school, elementary school the next day and, and reciting them to my friends. And we would recite them to, to each other. Sometimes we would try to claim the, the lyrics to be our own. Um, but it's that kind, of, um, um, that kind of learning process and, and, and early on, like transcribing and, and learning, learning words and learning um, rhythm and learning the deeper meaning of, of the lyrics that also informs this project. So there are, there are about 50,000 songs, and, and I intend for the project to be exhaustive, um, to have every lyric in every hip hop song every, ever, ever made. And that equates to about 3,000 artists and about 5,000 albums. And this is a list of the metadata. So of course, we have artist name, song title, album title. Those were um, some of the first um, um, pieces of data that I, that I, that I collected. And, um, and I have geolocation for all the artists. So there's, there's two fields for geolocation. One is where the artist was born, and the other was where the artist represents. So Tupac was born in New York, but it defaults to California because that's what he represents. The release date, um, total number of words, total number of um, polysyllabic words, the word count, average syllables per word, average letters per syllable, average letters per word, and the education level based on read, uh, readability formulas. The education level needed to be able to read the lyrics with understanding from um, um, illiterate to postgraduate. So, you know, profound and profane. It's like killing a, a fly with a sledgehammer, right? Like, I want to understand hip hop. Let's put it in a database and, and analyze it. But since it's in this form, um, it gives, it gives the, um, listening to it a different context. So we have the content of the lyrics. We have a location on earth for every utterance in hip hop. In the whole um, corpus of music, every word has a location on earth and a time and space. 
So it gives a total different context to, um, to the music. And this is one of the an early um, data viz that I made, which is a parallel, coordinate, parallel coordinates graph of um, the top is 50 Cent's career, or you can see it, and the bottom is Jay-Z's career. And the coordinates are um, year, word count, sentence count, polysyllabic words, um, um, sentence, flash, and smog. The last two are readability formulas. So now instead of um, having barbershop debates or dorm room debates about who's the best, who did it the first, who, who did it first, or who influenced whom, those arguments are usually left up to the loudest person or the person that speaks the most. And, but now that, you know, I'm building a tool to, to, um, to, 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 to prove this scientifically. And we can get back to this. This, 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 is, this chart says a lot. Um, another project I did, an early project I did, was um, I used Jared Thorpe's um, correlation tool um, to chart um, a battle between, uh, a famous battle between Nas and Jay-Z. So Jay-Z's takeover is on the left and Nas's ether is on the right. And the words that they use to diss each other, that they share to diss each other, are down the middle. The words that Jay-Z uses exclusively to diss Nas are on the left. The words that Nas uses exclusively to diss Jay-Z are on the right. So again, it's, you know, gives another context of a rap battle. Like, um, there are many different ways to listen to hip hop, but um, and 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 there are some people like myself that listen to hip hop in an intricate way like this, where this totally makes sense. So again, since um, there are geocodes for all the rappers, you can start to, to chart the um, the geography of the language in hip hop. So this is um, Staten Island rappers placed in Google Earth. Um, and you, you know, using the geography, you can start to chart slang, like where does slang start and how does it spread, like dog. Like in the, um, in the mid 90s, um, New York, I'm from New York, New York rappers were using the word dog a lot. Um, I went to school in, um, in the South, in Atlanta, and I learned the word dog from my friends, from my, my roommate from Baytown, Texas. So just an interesting, and, and there's, there's never any talk about at that time, the influence of um, the South on the North. And this is um, a list of Kentucky rappers, speaking of the South. And um, I guess the, the um, latest data visit that I did was, is called Champagne Always Stains My Silk. And it's a look at um, champagne brand mentions of rappers from 1980 to 2010 in the United States. So of course, right, you laugh. But like, because we all know images of rappers in champagne. Um, but if you look at champagne as um, an, an aspirational product, something that people use to, um, I mean, that's why it, is, it was made for the czar. It was made for Russian czars. It was made because Russian czars said, we want something to drink that no one else has had before and, and, and should be worthy of us. So that, um, that luxury, if you look at it when it's, uh, at times when it's used in hip hop and times when people um, choose to drink and celebrate and how they drink and celebrate champagne, you get more into like the cultural study. So this is the map view and then there's three views. This is the graph view and this is the song view. And this is online, this is actually live online. Um, this is one of my favorite quotes. Um, and it, it depends on how you, like I said before, me and my friends listen to hip hop and on a, on a, um, on a, like on a atomic level. And one thing I love about hip hop is that you have to know how to listen to it. You can listen to it on the radio, driving in your car. And I mean, the way, the way lyrics are, are written for the most part, there's so many meanings um, um, hidden inside the lyrics because the rapper wants to be challenged. So they'll write a song for general um, consumption. They'll write a song with, sub, with a subplot for them, themselves. They'll write a song for a subplot for hustlers or a subplot for their friends, and they'll all be in the same song. So with this closer look, um, um, 
I look at um, the Cristal Provers. So some next steps, I'm, at, I'm currently at um, the Du Bois Institute for African and African American Research at Harvard, where I'm going to be doing um, a lot more research projects and data viz projects. Um, and some of them are, deal with um, taking this data and producing it, these data uh, visualizations in physical form so that um, we can see what 90s hip hop looks like. Is there, is there a feeling that we get when we're in a room with it, surrounded by it? Um, some, some other projects are um, um, abstracting the data and, and getting a sound of the music. Like, is there a key or a tone for 90s gangster rap? And of course, some performance, like what, what would a performance look like to that, ta to that tone? And of course, uh, also like some jigsaw type um, work where like a new narrative is made and extracted from the lyrics. Um, and that link on the bottom is, um, is where the champagne data viz is. Thanks. That's some impressive work. Well, make some noise, some more noise for Tahir's work. I'm kind of, I'm going to put Tahir on blast and say that I'm going to be harassing you because I work at a, an organization called Media Literacy Project and we talk about the effect of media, uh, you know, it's, it's popular to say on our young people because we try to act like we're so smart and it doesn't affect us, but the, the, po the effect of media on all of us um, because we get inundated by it and when you can look at it quantifiably in something like that, that's not just interesting to people who want to sell you products, that should be interesting to you, so we'll, uh, we'll follow up about that, we need to blog about that and let people know that there's a tool. So I want to introduce our second panelist uh, joining us from Ottawa, Canada. Quende Kafense was born and raised in the greater Toronto area and is currently living and working in Ottawa, Canada. Fascinated by cities, his various professional ventures reflect different explorations and investigations into how they function with a particular focus on culture and more recently, space, which is something that's near and dear to New Mexicans. His academic research about the emergence of hip hop culture and its connection to the built environment is contributing to a feature for the National Film Board's high rise documentary series. He currently works with a small but mighty team of cultural planners and a dedicated community based steering committee to renew the city of Ottawa's strategic long range plan for arts, heritage and culture. He is a contributor to Open City Projects and is currently working on a book project about the connection between the emergence of the international style of architecture in New York and the globalization of hip hop culture. Quende, like you all know from the block party perhaps, is also DJ Mimetic. He was formerly a journalist for the Ottawa Express and a guest author on Richard Florida's Creative Class Exchange, writing regularly about how cultural scenes develop and function in cities. I present to you Quende Cafense. Hey everybody. Everybody have fun at the block party yesterday? Yeah, yeah block party was dope. I like that. That was a good vibe. Um, okay, let me just go. Okay, very nice. Uh, okay, uh, thank you uh, firstly to Isaiah and people of Albuquerque uh, for bringing me here. I really appreciate it. It's been super fun in the desert. It's my first time. Um, but yeah, uh, this is uh, about hip hop in the city. So uh, this is just some context. Uh, MC Shan, uh, one, of my, one of my favorite rappers from Queens, uh, had a song and an entity said hip hop. It started out in the park. And uh, the following, the quote underneath it is a, uh, is a quote from Jeff Chang's Can't Stop, Won't Stop about modernist architecture, uh, particularly the tower in the park style. And, and uh, this, is, this is what we're gonna be looking at today. So the idea at the core of this project uh, is about the configuration of the South Bronx and the active role that space played uh, in the emergence of hip hop culture. Uh, it came to me pretty intuitively actually. I was watching a movie. Uh, I was watching La Haine, 
uh, in fact, and we'll get back to that. Uh, but at the same, at that time, uh, I had shortly, it was shortly after I'd read Michael Chang's Can't Stop, Won't Stop, and I was a uh, DJing and I was a writer, and I really, uh, again, I had my intent was to write something uh, interesting and original about hip hop culture because uh, it was important to me, uh, still is. And so um, I was looking for an original angle, essentially, to, to write something. And uh, Michael Chang didn't leave much there. He was very, very comprehensive and thorough in his book, and uh, I wasn't sure if there's was anything really left to say. Uh, and so uh, I was in my fourth year at university. I was studying, uh, I took a program where in the fourth year you do political philosophy and political science, essentially. And so uh, I was reading a lot of Heidegger, uh, the German philosopher. And, uh, and, and, and it really set me off because his way of thinking was radical and it really came together with the way I was thinking about things. Because for him, the world of being uh, or, or, or like the thing of things that are phenomenologically intelligible, uh, they're really connected to that of becoming. So the way that things come to be, the processes uh, of, of forming something that's intelligible. And so in his mind, uh, while modern philosophy spent a lot of its time looking at the tree, uh, what was more important was really the roots and that the tree probably had more to do with the roots than it did with our perception of the tree itself. And so this really got me thinking. I said, Yo, well, what are the disembodied elements of hip hop then? Like, wow, how did it come together? And so obviously there are the four elements, you know, the DJing, uh, uh, rap, MCing, uh, b-boying, and graffiti. And uh, we could say that those are uh, were some of the elements, but they don't really, uh, they are not really the disembodied elements. Those are the, those would be in the trunk of the tree, I would say. And so we were thinking, you know, uh, everything else sprouted out of them, but what did the tree itself sprout from? And each of the elements has its own history and they all form uh, the root structure, uh, in in, sorry, excuse me, uh, including the conditions of racialization and poverty uh, and the impression and, and, and also all those things were critical parts of it, the change that the city was going through. But when I really thought about it, um, I wasn't looking for the roots as much uh, as I was looking for uh, the frame that had, that some, what framed all of the roots. So instead of looking at, uh, at uh, at what uh, the roots were, I realized I was looking really at what the soil was, and that was really what I was looking for. And so I realized that that was the Bronx. That's the soil, that's where the whole culture comes from. Uh, this is a reproduced map uh, from uh, Jeff Chang's uh, Can't Stop, Won't Stop of the Seven Mile World. And so the Seven Mile World is the area that the South, Bro that, uh, in the area in the South Bronx that hip hop emerged out of. And I started thinking, okay, well, what's particular about the South Bronx? What's special about it? Well, uh, as was mentioned uh, really eloquently uh, by our host, uh, our moderator, you know, uh, the South Bronx was dead in the middle of a major, uh, of a major uh, regional planning project for the city of New York. And uh, it was changing in a very radical way. Um, uh, it would be, it was right in the crosshairs of, of, of uh, excuse me, sorry. Right, it was right in the crosshairs of, a ma of that major regional planning project. And Robert Moses, who was the coordinator of this project, had a very particular vision of how he wanted to see uh, this project move, including the, uh, the erection of the Cross Bronx Expressway that would cut right through the Bronx and change the way it looked. And so, there was a construction explosion in the 50s and 60s, and there was a movement, uh, there was a dual movement, uh, one out of the city, uh, into the suburbs that were created um, using a lot of funding from the National Housing Act. And then at the same time, it was chafed by a movement into the Bronx by a lot of people who were facing a lot of socioeconomic barriers looking for access uh, to a lot of the public housing uh, that, was, that was available. And so um, what's interesting is that, uh, you know, while the area was really synonymous with this decay uh, in the 70s and, and, and the erosion of sort of like the social and physical fabric of the community, this international and global culture arose out of this decay. And so a lot of these places were depleted, but there had to be something generative about, about them and about the way the young people in the seven mile world were using these spaces. And there's a recent film that came out called Pruitt I Go Myth. Uh, about the, uh, about the uh, housing project in St. Louis, Pruitt Igo, which when it came down was really symbolized the death of modernism to a lot of uh, architects and people who were looking at that, looking at that discipline. But uh, as the film points out, that no one living in the failing projects blamed modernism for their collapse. And there's a lot of scholarship that would indicate that different management techniques could have saved a lot of these projects. And so uh, modernism is still, uh, but 
even still, modernism is still really blamed for the shape that these communities uh, were in. And so uh, the shape is the most interesting thing, and that's what really struck me uh, when I was looking at this film. And so we're just going to go to quickly a YouTube clip of, uh, what, of the film that I saw when I, when I did get my idea about this. Let me just figure out. Let's see, let's try this again. I think it's on. We can almost minimize the part about the powers and I can get into it. Ta gueule Putain, mais t'es mal à vache, t'es mal à vache, t'es mal à vache. Mais ta gueule avec ta vache, toi Ils ont arrêté. Vas-y, viens, reviens, on va taper les cheveux. Ça y est, attends, j'ai vu la vache là, elle était là, putain, la même chose. C'est toi la vache C'est ma mère, elle était là la vache, putain, je te. Arrête, tu me crois pas, je te jure, je viens d'avoir là Ta gueule In the film that, uh, that cow had been following him around all, all film and no one believed that he actually had seen the cow and so it was significant in the movie but not so much to my example. Anyhow, uh, let's, let's look at some, uh, quickly, uh, let's look at some block typologies. And so these are popular block typologies, uh, urban, ty urban block typologies that are moving through the decades and can anybody uh, tell what kind of block we were looking at uh, during that flyover scene or can anybody connect it to any Yeah, it's pretty obvious. It was, the it was that one in the 30s. And um, yeah, it, it made me realize that, uh, this is that that was the city that also that hip hop came from and that the city not only radically breaks from this vernac the vernacular styles of space that we see moving through the 1800s, uh, basically into the early 20s, but uh, it also just establishes a whole new regime of space which he had never seen before. And so it was intuitive that there was something fundamental that had changed uh, and I couldn't uh, quite put my finger on it and it took quite a bit of groping in the dark, but eventually I discovered uh, that there was a book uh, called Space is the Machine. 
And uh, it's by uh, a theorist called Bill Hillier, and it's about uh, a discipline and and uh, discipline and an analytic and a uh, normative uh, theory called uh, space syntax. Um, and so, uh, space syntax is about urban configuration, and configuration is the way that all the elements in the system relate to each other simultaneously. So it's about applying configural measures to patterns of different geometric elements that are created by buildings at a local scale, and then also cities at the largest scale. And so those configurations of a spatial network at both the local and global shape, uh, at the local and global level, uh, they shape the patterns and the potential of co-presence in any natural environment. And so this is uh, one of the uh, uh, quotes that, 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 that I found fundamental is that you know, human behavior doesn't simply happen in space, it actually has a spatial form and that each kind of social relation actually has a spatial pathology. And so, um, and so when we think about configuration, the reason that it's so elusive is that uh, there are ideas that we think with and there are ideas that we don't think of really. They're almost uh, grammatic rules that uh, we use to understand space, but we don't actually talk about them discursively very often. And so we can demonstrate some examples of this. And so, you know, this is a, are we awake? This is a, right, okay. This is a, <laughs> right, it's like a bikini, but it's a triangle. Um, uh, and this is a what? Something, something, but what's this? It's the same thing, right? And we can make it out of any number of things, but we recognize the configuration. And uh, this could, that's sort of the way that configuration works. Our capacity to understand the configurations are intuitive, but our ability to understand, and our ability to understand an urban network works the same way. So the intelligibility of an urban network has to do with how well we can intuit the global configurations of our local position in it. And so some configurations make this easier than others. And we're gonna uh, uh, look at another example of configuration here. And so we can see two different blocks that are made of the same elements. But one, the one on the right, uh, or whereas, or rather we'll say the one on the left, uh, we can see that it forms sort of a, a, a spoke configuration that extends sort of out beyond the parameters of the block, uh, a somewhat intelligible configuration, whereas the one on the right is quite a bit more broken and disassociated. And um, we can see that they have a very, very different feel just by looking at them and by analyzing them through their movement networks. Um, and then beyond that, what's interesting is that that central square on the one on the left, if we try to move it to somewhere else in, in the block, no matter what we did, even if we moved it to somewhere else, all the rest of the, uh, the, rest of the, all the, rest of the uh, grid would still be pointing towards that center square because the center square isn't uh, something that was plopped down uh, topogra in a, in a, in a top-down way, but rather it's an emergence of all these micro uh, micro, uh, micro interactions that are happening uh, that form the intelligible grid. And so um, that's, a, that's one of the second sort of, that's one of the first rules of space syntax, which is the rule of spatial emergence and the way that larger scale, and the, the properties that we understand in urban networks at a larger scale come from these smaller scale, um, come from these smaller scale interactions. And the second are the laws of generic function. And these are uh, fundamental premises for interacting with space. They're very sort of simple ideas that have been formalized um, uh, so that we can do analysis with them. And so the first is that people move in lines. And this is fairly, uh, it seems fairly intuitive that when you walk down the street, you do so in a straight line and that we move in linear ways when we drive in cars uh, and traditionally when we move in urban networks. It seems pretty self-evident, but still stated. The second is that people interact in convex spaces. And that's just to say that we interact in spaces, or that rather that when we are sitting and talking to each other, we do not in a place where we can't see each other. There's, there's usually a, a convex space around us, or rather that we can form a convex space around that interaction. And then uh, the third is that we see changing visual fields as they move around built environments. And that's just to say, as we move down any particular street, we see different things as we move. And, uh, and the perspective on, or our perspective on that network changes as we move through it. And those uh, changing visual fields, there's a technical term for them, are uh, called isovists. And so um, there's sort of, and there's a way to measure based on isovistic potential in an area, based on sort of the way that uh, the things that we're able to see 
as we move through the urban network. And so that's all just to say that we perceive space visually based on what we see, based on convex spaces for interaction and how they're related to each other, and the linear relationship between the destination and the spaces one has to pass to to get to them. And so by using mathematical techniques related to all those aspects of space, uh, we can uh, really begin to see how social and cultural patterns are imprinted on socio-spatial configurations and how spatial layouts affect their functioning. And so we layer them. What we, what we would do is take all of these uh, perspectives, all these mathematical perspectives and layer them and then we can really start uh, getting uh, a rich understanding of, of, of how movement within that network affects social function. And so spatial design uh, in the end really affects patterns of natural co-presence and co-awareness uh, of the individuals that make up the physical and virtual communities. And the primary spatial effect of this modernist style in the Bronx uh, was that it established whole new patterns of co-presence and co-awareness that were really amplified further uh, by, uh, and modified by all the agents. Oh, sorry. Uh, um, and so uh, when Herc brought his parties to the street and others followed between 1973 and 1979 when recorded hip hop really started, uh, they became really social integrated as social objects. And as social objects, as you said before, they have a natural social, um, spatial pathology. So both internally as individual parties, but globally throughout that seven mile world uh, in the way that they formed a network. And so understanding uh, that initial configuration of the street party scene, it offers a, a much greater insight into the role that space played into the, into the process of emergence uh, that, that, the, that the individual elements underwent to, be co to form this culture. And it was a process of weak emergence, and that's an interesting phenomenon in and of itself. And that's when a high level phenomenon uh, arises from a low level domain. And so we can take a colony of ants as a very simple example of this. Uh, the sophisticated structure that they form being an anthill uh, isn't a product of some queen ant who's letting them all know what to do. Uh, in fact, it uh, it's, it's comes from a very limited set of tasks that goes on totally unnoticed by any of the individual ants as they're doing their behaviors. And uh, it res it's a result of two main factors. One is the local scale and, uh, and the other is the structure of the space. And so all the decisions are made at a local scale. So if the two ants can't communicate they won't form the macro behavior because it's about, that lo it's about their localized communication that enables their behavior to scale up. And then secondly, it formed, as, as I was saying, it's formed on feed, the colony structure is formed on feedback between the ants. And so if they're not all together moving around each other, forming that feedback loop, uh, the, the sophisticated structure that we recognize as the ant hill would never form. It's as a result of their, of, their, uh, of their structure, and that's just to say that intelligent systems depend on structure and organization. Um, and that sort of, an intelligent system is sort of what uh, these kids in the Bronx were building for themselves. And so street parties, uh, they were a localized effect of the new densities and local configurations of the modernist style of buildings, but there's a lot more to it. Uh, the seven mile world was really refit and an alternative uh, generative social configuration uh, was established, uh, further integrating the global configuration of this, of this space. Uh, and so it was within that global configuration that this new uh, macro behavior, this emergent behavior of hip hop that was composed of these four individual things uh, took its recognizable shape. And uh, the young people increased the amount of two spaces in an area that was predominantly just through spaces and it was all informed by this, uh, by this cultural idea that they generated themselves. And so uh, the other thing that's interesting which I haven't really touched on is the role that sound played because sound was really the big integrator of the space. When I went uh, down to the Bronx to interview some of the originators, they really talked a lot about how um, the sound really was what integrated the space. They would hear the parties and then they would inevitably go down to the space to this, the co-present space being the, being the block party. And so, um, uh, so the research still has some ways to go. I still need to get a little bit of comparative data uh, on population, population density as well as some the historical maps of the Bronx, uh, some different historical maps of the Bronx that I could use to do uh, syntactic modeling. I also need to develop that idea of an isovis that's, that's based on sound, something like sonic. Uh, that, that can integrate a space. Uh, but at the same time, um, it's still a really interesting idea to consider that hip hop, uh, hip hop's roots is about uh, a generative social configuration of space. And it's certainly worth pursuing uh, not only in understanding hip hop, but also in the broader context of city building. How do we integrate? Uh, how do we integrate spaces within the city? Uh, and so, uh, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Uh, thank you very much. So, 
I know you have questions, because I do, right? So can I bring them forward into the light and, and let us have a discussion? Is that okay with you guys? That's cool. Let me, look, let me check my trusty go-go gadget cell phone here. And uh, so I have three o'clock, and I don't know what time we were supposed to be out. But you know, we'll stay for a while, if you all stay for a while. Now, I said I'd let y'all have some fun, but I kind of get I kind of get paid on being able to ask my question first. Like that's my reward, right? And so, and I think I came up with some really good ones. You guys, let me know if they suck, okay? So, um, uh, that was both both of your research is fascinating. So, uh, I just want to give us a collective round of applause for Quende and Tahir. I've tried many a times to explain the science and mathematics of hip hop to my parents. And, and they look at me like I have an eye in the middle of my forehead. But now, there's actually <laughs> academic research around this stuff, and I can go back and look smarter than I am. But um, I want to start with Tahir, since we had Tahir's information a little further ago. And uh, there was something really interesting you talked about, and uh, th there was this art that you wanted to create, but there was no tool to create it. And so that's a theme. I mean, that's a theme, that was a th that's a theme of hip hop. Uh, some of the research I was doing before I came here was that, you know, Grandmaster Flash, some of you know Grandmaster Flash is, ended up working with Rain Corporation on developing something called the Empath Mixer, um, where the music that he was like imagining, that he wanted to create was so far out there and so futuristic, um, so, you know, Bill Clinton-like, that, um, Bill Clinton-like, George Clinton-like, <laughs> that um, <laughs> Bill was not futuristic. We could talk about, anyway, <laughs> we'll talk about his economics later. But, uh, but this idea that some of the things that these young people in, in, in the beginning in, mm -hmm. in the Bronx were doing was just really so far ahead of, ahead of its time that uh, I was reading a lot about how they just changed the use of things. So yeah, uh, a turntable already existed, but it wasn't meant for scratching until someone scratched on it, right? Uh, Herbie Hancock was, was, was adjusting synthesizers to get that rocket sound that all his hip-hop heads love so well. So I would... Wanted to talk more, or get you to talk more, Tahir, about this idea that what else is there in hip hop, um, in your opinion, as you kind of move into the second phase of your research, that, uh, that kind of needs, needs something that could be created. Like you were talking about that thing in the middle. There's always something between you. There's always something between you and the art. Is there anything else that you see that, uh, where there's a void, where there needs to be something else? <laughs> but see, I mean, you saw the void about the database, and then you just created the database. So is there anything else you see? Um. I think um, the, a, a, a lot of things, mm -hmm. a lot of things. One, one would be, um, <clears throat> I think the Zulu Nation organization should have, um, have more power in, in uh, regulating hip hop. Mm -hmm. that, sure. that would be, that would sure. be really cool. interesting. Yeah, yeah. Um, and not, not on a, in, in an, uh, an elitist way, like, you know, what is hip hop or what isn't hip hop, but a formalized school for study. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Where, you know, we have these 50 year old um, pioneers um, and we have these 15 year old, you know, um, upstarts and there's no communication. Like, there was, there was a, um, a, a song that came out. Who was it? It was, um, it was Big Sean. Mm. And and there was a beef between Big Sean and Ludacris, right. yeah. and Ludacris used some rhyme style, and Big Sean was Big Sean is like in his early twenties, Ludacris is in his forties, um, and Ludacris did a song, and he used a rhyme style that Big Sean was uh, um, was known for, even though he came out twenty years after. So Big Sean came at Ludacris and was like, you're biting my style. <laughs> and then Ludacris came out with a song that, yeah. that chronicled th the, this yeah. rhyme style yeah. from before Lu Ludacris used yeah. it and recorded and had a, a, a in, in the intro of the song, um, there was a snippet of Ludacris at 15 using the rhyme style and then everyone else that, that came before Big Sean that used the rhyme style. So if there was like some kind of formalized university where 
it doesn't have to, that doesn't have to happen over beef where there's an understanding because, I mean, the culture is vast. The culture is doc, well documented. I mean, they're, they're, it, it should be taught officially. And I think, I think Ben Bottle's working on a, on a uh, hip hop uh, museum in, in the South Bronx. Because I know, like, I, and I agree with you, because the other thing, what's interesting too, is that this, I mean, I've gone down to New York to go to the Zulu Nation anniversary parties and so on, and it's like, you're right, you don't see enough people down there uh, who, who are uh, in the hip hop industry, who are, are sort of in that commercial industry, that whole commercial side of it. And then also, yo, a lot of the research side isn't there too. Mm. A lot of the people who are doing research, yo, they're not at the Zulu Nation stuff. And, you know, those are the people who started it. You know, those are like, you know, if, yeah, I mean, as we move forward in history and, and hip hop becomes, uh, you know, further and further edified, these people are like the people who started it and that we're not taking uh, advantage of the fact that they're still here and they still want to tell that story. Uh, you know, I think, yeah, it would be nice if there was some, some more uh, formal way to integrate, integrate pioneers. I think, and I, I, I agree with these, the experts here. I mean, I'm 34, so I always say that I'm, you know, just a little bit older or younger than hip hop. Mm -hmm. And so when you talk about that much knowledge that's been created and it's just starting to be accepted in places like this now, though you say it's very visionary, but you know, even UNM had briefly a hip hop spoken word course. I don't even know if they have it anymore. Um, who's gonna preserve our culture and our information unless we do? And uh, that's why the work that you guys are doing is fascinating. Um, so a, a question for you, Quinday, or to start with you and then come back to Tahir. You mentioned, because uh, I was fascinated with this idea, that configurations are intuitive, yeah. right? And, uh, and we, that right. sound mm -hmm. is because it's very dense and percussive. So yeah. that means it actually is like a bit of data. Yeah. Like it holds information. Mm -hmm. Like it's solid mm -hmm. and, it's, and it's really... Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know, I would, I would like you to talk a little bit more about this idea that we see configurations. That my, my, my naturist... And my ecological people know that we see that all the time. They can yeah. talk about fractals and stuff, different yeah, yeah. patterns. But you talk a little absolutely. More about I mean, yeah. I mean, that was one of the. It's it's interesting because when Tahir was talking about uh, the idea that there was something between him and what he was looking for artistically, uh, it was a very similar thing for me. Like you know, when I was looking, when I because uh, I would look at I look I watched this movie and I went to New York and I was walking around and I would get this feel. And I would understand that, like, and beyond that, I would go different places internationally, and I would uh, always try and find, you know, the, the hip hop pioneers in that area. Like, where were they from? Where did they, you know what I'm saying? And I would always, it would inevitably would end up in a place that felt like the South Bronx, you know what I'm saying? I didn't understand if there was a, uh, I just couldn't put it together what the feeling was or like how to even quantify it. And then when I found, uh, when I, I started really studying the phenomena of emergence, because that was where uh, I was at in my research at that time. And then through looking at emergence and, and, uh, and architecture, somehow I stumbled on this space syntax stuff. And that was really what uh, was empowering for me, because I could see that there was something mathematical to this as well, and, but that I couldn't, I'm not proficient enough at math to invent the mathematics to to do that. And just the fact that there had been somebody working on this from the 70s and putting together these ideas was really about configuration and about the impact that it has on the way that we perceive the world uh, was really, really empowering for me uh, because it really opened up, yeah, it opened up my eyes to, to, that, to that whole reality about, about, uh, about space. You know, the, just the, I mean, one of the more interesting things uh, for me that I read in this thing was that uh, when he talks about the, the idea that the urban grid is the, is the predictor, is the most, uh, is, the, is the greatest predictor of movement in an urban network. And that's sort of a simple thing to say, but it's an interesting thing to think that this grid sort of determines the way that you move. And sort of really thinking, thinking more deeply about that uh, and, and those configural aspects of it uh, really, really were very, very helpful for me. Um, <clears throat> it's interesting, when, I, when you were talking, I, I thought about a project that I, I worked on. Um, There's a psychogeographic map of um, hip hop in New York City. Mm -hmm. And like when I, like when, when I walk through the city and I come, well, there's, there's a, an affliction that, that I kind of coined the, 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 um, 
the term is um, hip hop Tourette's. So <laughs> when you're in regular conversation and someone um, says a word and the word reminds you of a hip hop lyric, yep. you recite the hip hop lyric. I just right? wanna say something. Yeah. Um, I got a homeboy here uh, from who came down with me. I didn't come down with me, we met up down here. Uh, he's an electronic, uh, he does engineering himself and we were talking. Uh, we went out to get a, just a bottle drink earlier. And uh, I was looking at the, what, what the options were, and I saw they had lemonade. And I was like, yeah, lemonade, lemonade was a popular drink, yeah, and it yeah. still yeah, is. Yeah. And then I, and I grabbed it, and I grabbed it, and I left. And then my friend, he asked me, he said, why'd you get the lemonade? I said, well, it's a popular drink, and it still is. And it's like, yo, that, that totally happens. Man. So you have it. You have yeah. it, too. Yeah. So, right, so, you have it, too. Yeah. Yeah. So with that, you know, I um, decided to map I decided to map New York City in that in that way. Mm -hmm. yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Um, like, whenever I get off of the, um, on the F train at Delancey Street, Dana Dane's song "Delancey yeah, Street" Del rings yeah. rings in my head. So I started building a map um, to look at um, how a hip hop enthusiast might understand the city and how 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 that person might create the space of the city. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, man. I mean, yeah, because the other thing is all those, all of those, uh, all those songs. You know, they create uh, a mythology in your own, in your mind, like a, uh, and and that's its own. You know, in your in your in your cognitive space, you start you start mapping it out. You know, when I was a kid, uh, you know, I had I. I didn't have, well, because my aunt lived in New, my aunt uh, was, in, was in Brooklyn and we used to go down and visit her quite a bit. But when I was down there, I wanted to go to Albion Square Mall. I wanted to go because that was a song by Biz Marquee, Albion Square Mall. And I was like, oh, I know there's a place out here called Albion Square. Let's go there. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to go. And it was like, you know, I mean, it's, it's that thing. It's the way that uh, the lyrics can create destinations in your mind. And then, and then when you get into the physical space, the way... Uh, the way that's affected, the way that affects the, your your um, the way you the way you move in that space. The mall the mall was torn down, but the neighborhood is pretty yeah. much the same. Yeah, it's yeah, being yeah. gentrified, but it's still the same as it was in the eighties. Yeah, no doubt. And it's like uh, what's interesting too is that like like when I went down to the when I went down to the Zulu Nation thing, it was interesting because um, I, I work at, I work at a at a city I work at city hall in Ottawa. And uh, you know, in in culture, and a lot of the people there, uh, well, they're you know they're culture people. They like to they like to travel and do things, and so a lot of them they all go to New York like all the time. And when I went to New York, I um, they were like, oh, where did you go? Did you go Lower East Side? Blah blah blah. I was like, no, I went to the Bronx. And they're like, oh. Yeah, I guess, you know, I guess you could go there. Mm -hmm. But it's like, but that was like the first place I thought to go. That's the only place I wanted to go. Like that's where that's what New York sort of means to me. And it's like uh and it's as a result of this, you know, as a result of the interaction with the culture, you know? Mm -hmm. It's like uh for me being from Philly, you know, the places where we all hung out when I was a teenager was uh of course it was the plateau because Will Smith and DJ Zay Jeff had rapped about the plateau in summertime. So mm -hmm. that's where everybody hung out at. Mm -hmm. um, and then of course the South Street with the roots. Right. We talked about a lot in their early songs. So and it becomes this kind of soundtrack, this surreal soundtrack that we all have our own soundtrack populated with our own kind of mental Pandora that happens, you know, in our head. So I was going to say to Tahir, he, he's probably got enough ideas to fill a war chest right now, but, <laughs> exactly. you know, like audio tours of New York yeah. where, where the people can grab a headphone for a day and as they walk through the hood, they can hear the song that's germane to that area. But, but we do this all day. Do y'all have questions?